All right, folks, welcome to the first episode of our season three of The Watch Table. I'm so excited to be back. We had a, I don't know, two, three year hiatus because of obvious reasons. Uh, we are back and we're sitting down with Andrew, who, uh, I mean, if you just look at this collection, it's uh, tremendously uh, <laughs> huge, first of all. I think this is only maybe 20% of your watches. These are the ones that made the cut, if you will. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there are a few. <laughs> but I'm excited to bring the watch table back. It's such a fun thing, and I'm so glad we're able to do it um, and feel comfortable doing it. Uh, and of course, our very first guest is uh, Andrew, who, who you guys might know on Instagram as what, like Vintage Benz 7? Vintage 1982 Benz, okay. which is my birth year. I do not own a vintage Mercedes yet. Yet, yeah. okay. So one day when you see all the oil in the parking lot, it's either gonna be one of my old Land Rovers or- It'll fit with the Rover, yeah, kinda, yeah. Perfect, yeah. great, I love it. Well, first of all, welcome to the watch table. Thank you. Uh, as a fan throughout the years, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm really excited. And then, of course, I have to ask the question of, why do you love watches? Oh, I mean, we could have a whole shoot just about that, couldn't we? <laughs> um, for me, it started with like just the aesthetics and as a design object. I've always really liked them as an accessory. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons I love my, my Olmstead so much is you can swap the straps on it to match your shoes, match your belt. You have so many, a myriad of options. Um, and then it started down a wormhole at some point. <laughs> really, you know, as so many people, uh, uh, I think in this hobby do, like once you get into mechanical timekeeping, it takes on a whole new level of, uh, I mean, I would even really use the word obsession. Um, yeah, yeah, sickness, obsession, whatever you want to call it. Hobby. Yeah, hobby. Yes, yes. Uh, so let's dive into your collection. It is sure. a fairly random, varied collection, which I kind of love. Um, but this certainly isn't your first watch, but it was a watch that was given to you as a gift and it was one of the watches that really got you started, your Swatch System 51. Yeah, so this watch I think was out in Europe for some time uh, and then released to the US market in 2015, 2014 thereabouts. Um, and soon thereafter, it was gifted to me uh, when my fiance was on work travel and she saw it and thought, Oh, you know, Andrew loves watches. Uh, this is a really cool watch. I think it's amazing what Swatch was able to do with the production of the System 51. Yep. The, the fact that you can mass produce and assemble things on this scale is really cool. Um, and it was my first watch with a display back. So that opened up, obviously, worlds yep. for me. Um, and it was shortly thereafter that I got, you know, some cheapo Seikos. Sure and then eventually an SKX and things like that and kind of started moving away and caring more about the movement and what was you know behind the dial and making things tick, so to speak, or sweep in this case. Yeah. So after the System 51, which is a great piece to be gifted and to learn more about watches and be able to see that display back, you wanted to dip your toes into something that was a little bit of a higher quality piece, something that was um, Swiss and, and maybe was the, another start to this long run of collecting, but it was with this Oris that you picked up. Yeah, that is the Cronoris date, um, which I had kind of, you know, you, you crush hard on a watch when you read the coverage coming out of Basel and then you find as many photos of it as you can online. And um, that was one I really, really had my eye on. Uh, I liked the colors there. I like kind of the funky 70s sort of vibe to it. Um, and, you know, Oris, I think, has very wisely positioned themselves as uh, an entry-level Swiss brand. Um, I like their history. I like that they're still privately held, family-owned company. Uh, and just because I started shopping, you know, these Swiss-made timepieces, it doesn't mean I forgot my roots, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I still, uh, not so much Orient, but I still love Seikos. I got a few Seikos and Grand Seikos here today. Uh, this is a fun one. The SPV 079, I believe, and it was a department store pickup. This is the biggest watch in my collection. I tend to wear stuff that is uh, anywhere from about 38 to 40 is my sweet spot. Eh, 36 to 40, I should say. 
This is 44, I believe, and 51 oh, lug to lug. That's not small. And this is one that I uh, was wearing, or I was looking at online, and you know, you can read the stats and the specs on paper, but it doesn't always really convey how a watch is gonna wear in person. Um, so I was reluctant to get it until I saw it in the metal. And it just so happened we were doing some holiday shopping here in Chicago uh, on State Street and what I still call Marshall Field. So I'll as, never use the other department store. As, as you should, um, as a Chicagoan does. And I got to see it in the case. It was great. I took it out. Uh, it was on the, the OEM silicon strap, uh, which is very nice for Seiko. Um, and, you know, it passed the, it passed the wrist test. And I was still unsure about it. it. was like, I have so many Seikos and too many <laughs> divers. I don't need another one. And Katie, Katie, you really have encouraged me down this path here. Um, she encouraged me on this Seiko. Uh, the, the salesperson was great and he gave me a really, really good deal on it. And we were actually staying downtown in a hotel, uh, just kind of touristing your own town around the holidays, seeing all the lights sure. and, and stuff like that. And I woke up the next morning and she said, you're still thinking about that watch, just go get it. <laughs> um, but it's fun, it reminds me of that, uh, that holiday season and staying downtown in a nice hotel, ordering room service, just kind of living it up and treating ourselves a little bit, yeah. so. Chicago and downtown during the holidays, it's really beautiful. Yeah. It really is. And then, you know, everybody talks about Grand Seiko. It's another one, you know, in recent years, I think they've become more prevalent and more common. You yes. see more and more in the collecting community People are into it. Um, this was my first Grand Seiko, an experience with the brand, which is kind of a weird entry point. Uh, it's a JDM model. Uh, it is titanium and it is a 9F quartz. And I was drawn by the story uh, behind the watch. A guy had been traveling, uh, had picked it up on a business trip to Japan. It had landed with a jeweler here stateside and I was looking to trade in. I think it was a Zin 556i. I sent it on trade with a little cash and got that. Grand Seiko in return. I call the dial Chicago River Blue because it's a really <laughs> weird uh, color. Yeah, uh, and so. and now we're kind of getting into the watches that um, I've known you as you've gotten them. We first met at the Worn and Wound event that we threw. Uh, I was at a beer garden downtown. We were kind of showing that the wind up crew that we should do an event here in Chicago. We should do a Chicago wind up, which we're happy to say we're doing one, which is exciting, very exciting. I don't know when this is gonna air. We'll have either done it or are about to do Summer it. Summer of, of 2022. But um, that's where you and I first met and you were totally yep. smitten with that Olmstead. Yes. And you came, I think it was a couple months later, to the HQ, took a look at them in the metal. Yeah, I really thought I would walk away with a uh, blue dial Olmstead because the blue and orange is very Okanoskar. It looks great. Um, but this white dial just got its hooks into me and uh, yeah, just couldn't stop staring at it, yeah. thinking about it, which is always a sign that, okay, you've got a new new watch incoming. <laughs> so decided on the white dial. It's awesome. Uh, you were great at the old HQ. Uh, I was about to set out on a trip, uh, kind of celebrating a recent engagement. Yep. That's why I didn't buy the watch initially was I was saving for an engagement ring. And then we headed down to New Orleans uh, to hang out for a week and celebrate. And I picked this watch up, I think the day before I left for the trip. I think it was. And it traveled with me uh, the whole time. Yeah, it was like the only watch I took on the trip. Yeah. Uh, just kind of making some memories with it uh, from the beginning. And it's been hard to get it off my wrist the last couple of years. Sure. And this is well before I worked for, with you and as part of the Okanoskar team. Yep. You know, I had this watch for a couple of years and it's been one of my most worn pieces yeah. in my collection. It's, it's extremely versatile, but Going to that, you actually bought another watch from us. And this is a fun story. I think is I'll that, let you tell it because from your perspective, it's it's almost more interesting. From my perspective, it's just, you know, holding secrets and it was devious and... Yeah, so uh, a few people on Instagram have commented about this, uh, this custom Olmstead with the orange case. And it was a gift to me from my fiance, Katie. And Nathan and Chase came over, this was during summer, late summer of 2021, uh, to deliver the watch to me in person, which yep. was a great personal touch. Yep. Um, which real quickly though, Katie had come to the office without you knowing, yeah. she was here, we were picking things out, yeah. we were trying different things and we came up with the design um, and it was something that really struck a chord with her knowing that you would love it. Yeah, she knows me and uh, 
was thinking that this would look good with my Detroit Tigers ball caps and a bunch of <laughs> the, the blues and oranges in my wardrobe. And, uh, you know, you were kind enough to collaborate with her and generate this one-off watch, and it is awesome. So Katie, uh, operating behind the scenes with you guys, staged this whole thing, kept everything secret, uh, under the, the guise of a colleague of hers was in from out of town, and we were going to host her for a little happy hour on our patio. <laughs> and I walk outside, and it's you and Nathan. Surprise! Yeah, so we begin chit-chatting and talking about watches, and I'm like, oh, hey, hey guys. And meanwhile, my mind is kind of spinning up, like, what, what on earth are they doing here? Like, Just saying hi. Yeah, and uh, Katie had staged all of this, obviously, and I don't know, five, ten minutes pass. And so finally, I turned to her and said, "Like, okay, so what? What are we? What's what are going we on doing here? Yeah, what are we doing that. here?" Uh, and I think I even blurted out, "Katie, did you bring them here to talk about job prospects? Because I just resigned from my previous position." And we had a laugh about that, and that came conversation came back to that later. Yeah. You said, "No, I have this watch for you." So it is a super cool one of one ceramic Olmsted uh, that literally says on the warranty card for the serial taco well we dubbed it the taco watch and yeah. that yeah. was what its code name was uh and the reason being is uh part of our relationship tacos have always been very important which i mean tacos are very important yeah let's be honest about that one it's got a sweet custom case back engraving of a taco and it says simpatico which is spanish for of the same mind or you're kind of on the same page with someone and when we first started dating we used to say that to each other all the time you know, hey, what do you want to do this weekend? Should we do? Oh yeah, simpatico. Like, yeah, enough said. <laughs> um, but our anniversary is the first Tuesday of every December because it's Taco Tuesday. Sure. So it's not a fixed date. It's a floating anniversary and we go and we eat tacos. Um, in addition to that, that was uh, when I proposed to her was taco anniversary. we call it. Um, <laughs> so this watch kind of goes deep um, with a lot of things in our relationship. And ultimately, it's what kind of sprang the conversations that that landed me this position with you. You know, if we want to talk about job stuff, oh, um, yeah. this piece you purchased, the FOIS, um, as you were celebrating, if you will, your tenure at your previous job to come here. Uh, yeah. So it was kind of a nice bookend uh, piece. The the my previous uh, job was uh, with a digital media news organization. And I was there for close to 15 years um, and helped grow the company from, you know, I was the fourth salesperson they hired, I think, and was managing a team of 12 or helping manage a team of 12 uh, at the time we were acquired and at the time then that I ultimately decided to leave. Um, you know, the owner of the previous owner of the company uh, took good care of me when the sale went through and, and was finalized. And I had long, I just have always wanted a Speedmaster. I mean, look, I'm not going to add anything to the conversation around this watch. <laughs> Fratello has books on it. There are multiple books just about Speedmaster, its history with space travel, yep. the various references and movements that Omega has used through the years. But since the 2012, I think it was, uh, announcement of the first Omega in space, I was really, really drawn to this watch. Yep. And it's one of those ones that, again, I had been kind of like stalking online and finding all the photos I could. And uh, they had recently, at the time, this is late 2020, announced the discontinuation of it, that they were gonna be phasing it out. Um, and that was when my company was sold and I kind of treated myself because I thought, if not now, when? And what a great way to look back on 15 years helping build a company and growing a team and it just reminds me of people that in so many ways were my family yeah. for a long time. Um, so yeah, this is one that I'm obviously never going to get, never yeah. going to get rid of yeah. here. That's a great story. And I love that. Yeah. Uh, no, not everything has a, a super like personal story here. The Tudor Black Bay 58. Yes. It's just so good. It's a great piece. I love it. It's so good. I liked the original release with the gilt, uh, but when they, they did the Navy, I like blue watches. Yep. Uh, I like snowflake hands. To me, too, this is, uh, I've always wanted a Pelagos, but I don't have the wrist really to pull it off, despite how well they wear. Yeah. Um, and when this came out, I was just immediately like, yeah, I'm going to be adding one of those. <laughs> it's great. Um, and it was great. This is another just awesome kind of confluence of circumstances amongst the watch fam on Instagram. 
I knew a collector that was letting go of his, and I knew the guy is in watch journalism. I know he takes good care of his things. Started messaging with him about what he wanted for it. They still weren't in boutiques. They were kind of more difficult to get. I ended up acquiring it from him as the third owner, and I asked him who the if he knew the first owner. It's like, yeah, I bought it directly from him as another watch blogger. So it's kind of a fun, nerdy provenance uh, on this watch. Right. And this, along with uh, you know the Olmsted on my wrist, has just been like, I wear this watch a lot. Yeah. Uh, it, it goes with everything, matches everything, looks good under a shirt cuff, uh, looks good on the beach or when you're traveling or whatever. Has I love the aluminum bezel insert. Uh, has a really really satisfying bit of extra detent at 12 o'clock that I. I, I don't m oftentimes play with bezels, but this is one that I just find that catch so yeah. satisfying. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of people did not love the OEM bracelet that this came on because of the faux rivets. Yep. I didn't mind it as much as others, but I've got I'm this. Not, I'm not a faux rivet fan. I've got it on a aftermarket uh, Uncle Seiko bracelet um, that I absolutely love. It's, you know, got a little play to it. Sure. Kind of just drapes around the wrist. Um, excellent, excellent watch. It's a good combo. So this is a really fun summer watch. Uh, this is a Breitling Super Ocean Heritage 57, I believe. Um, but it is wonderful on this Forstner clip band um, and just super, super fun to get uh, out of the watch box when the weather is warm. Weighs almost nothing uh, because the case architecture on this watch is absolutely crazy. Like the lugs are super thin and the bezel is like a UFO landed on top. It kind of <laughs> reminds me of Soldier Field and the renovations they did like yep. a decade ago there to add additional seating. Uh, but this is from a local Chicago collector um, and actually industry guy as well. I was able to acquire it via trade. Uh, I sent a Messina Unimatic his way in a little cash and then ended up adding a Breitling to my collection, which is really not something I ever thought I would I would say, uh, especially, you know, as somebody under 40, I always kind of just feel like Breitling is kind of a little stodgy. <laughs> um, and maybe it's just me and personal kind of perception and things, but um, it's a cool watch, you know, and uh, if I'm wearing it on a, a, with my grandpa slippers and whatever during the summer, so be it. So. <laughs> Well, I think that brings us to the rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Uh, I don't know. As ready as I'll ever be. Okay. I'm just gonna come at you. Okay. Uh, if you could uh, live... Let me take a drink first. <clears throat> oh. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? That's difficult. Um, sorry, I gotta keep it rapid. Let's say San Luis Obispo, California. Okay. Craftsman bungalow would be sweet. Awesome. Uh, favorite complication? You know, I just, uh, I really like just a three-hander. I like, you know this about me, I like just kind of a classic field watch. Simple, okay. Yeah. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Flight. Yeah. I think uh, that, yeah. It'd I mean, be so cool. It'd be easy. We're adding another question this year, is what's your favorite drink? Ooh, like specifically cocktail? Whatever, any, th any favorite drink. Uh, had a lovely birthday dinner with my fiance uh, this week and had a Negroni after the meal. And I love a Negroni. Negroni. The weather gets right. right. I really love a Negroni. So who would win in a fight? Person drunk on bourbon or a person drunk on Malort? Oh, that's dirty. Uh, I mean, Malort's dirty in general. Ambushing me with a <laughs> your clear bourbon bias with this question. Um, I got to go with the brown. I got it. The bourbon drunk is going to win that fight. <laughs> the the Malort drunk may have like shredded punk rock jeans and, and tattoos, but my money's on the man drinking the bourbon. Got it. Got it. Um, final question. How many day discs are in this little jar? Oh, can I touch it and get a closer look? Not, not long enough to count, but I'm going to go with, oh, wow. Uh, 42, which is the answer to like the universe and everything. 42? Yeah. All right. Well, with that, cheers and thank you so much for joining us. Hey, cheers, man. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.